Mark Gemini Thwaite from MGT, and this is Antihero Online. All right, so the big thing that we're here to talk about is the new record that's cl- coming up on the 23rd of February, Gemini Night. Uh, tell me a little bit about the record and the creative process that went into it. Uh, yeah, sure can. Uh, we actually started work on the Gemini Night material uh, when I was recording uh, my last album. I did a solo album uh, as MGT, my initials, um, for a German label, SBV, called Volumes, uh, back in... We started it back in uh, sort of late 2015, and uh, the album featured a bunch of guest vocalists on it, including uh, Ville Vallo from him and uh, Wayne Hussey from The Mission and uh, a whole bunch of folks that I know from the UK scene. And uh, also uh, a singer, Ashton Knight, from a South African band called The Awakening that I was introduced to. So I was kind of doing a song and in some cases two songs with some of the singers. And with Ashton, we just kind of kept writing. And before we knew it, we'd done like, uh, you know, half a dozen songs before the end of the year. Um, uh, we quickly decided that we'd just save them and release them as a separate entity. And uh, we talked about, you know, calling it Gemini Night, uh, which is partly a joke, just a, an amalgam in of our two names. And um, yeah, so uh, Volumes ended up coming out in the summer of 2016. And... Uh, and uh, Ashton and I continued to write throughout 2016, and we'd pretty much uh, gotten most of the album together by the end of that year. Um, and then it was just a case of, uh, you know, getting the record deal in place to release it. And, uh, yeah, we signed a deal last year in 2017 with Cleopatra Records and uh, Los Angeles-based label. And, but they were quite keen to keep, keep it as an MGT album. Um, and uh, release it, you know, c- capitalizing on the, the success of the previous one. So I guess we kind of treated it, kind of went from being like a solo record, MGT, to this album's like a band record. Uh, you know, like, I guess like Van Halen is kind of the name of the band as opposed to just the guitar player and the drummer. So, um, yeah, so it, you know, it kind of took us the nearly two years in, in a way from start to finish, but we actually sat on quite a large chunk of it for most of, most of last year, you know, we've released our first single last December. And it sounds like the creative spark just kind of happened, like, yeah, right off the gate as soon as you guys started writing music and working on some things together. What was it kind of like sharing that same level of creativity with a vocalist that could add to what you were doing on the guitar end? It's, um, it obviously feels good. I mean, it, it was, uh, I've played in a few bands over the years from the Mission UK to Peter Murphy's band. Uh, also played guitar for Tricky for a few albums and I've worked with various people. So I'm kind of used to writing with singers. I, I've never written lyrics myself. I've always, uh, just come up with the riffs and, uh, you know, chord sequences and arrangements. I guess I'm like a, a Jimmy Page, you know, you never hear Jimmy Page singing on anything. He just works with other, other singers and I'm, I'm the same. So I would just complete these demos, um, usually fairly fully formed with like an intro and a verse and a chorus and a, and a middle eight and it'll all be kind of set out and it's just minus a vocal and I'll send it on to somebody like Ashton Knight or, or Wayne Hussey from The Mission or Peter Murphy and then they will add their vocals usually uh, you know on their own little home recording systems and we kind of bounce ideas backwards and forwards I'm quite used to writing like long distance like that Usually where it started with like a demo of mine and then they'll come back with some vocals and they'll suggest an edit maybe. Uh, oh yeah, why don't you make that verse longer or that chorus shorter or move that section over here. And then before we know it, we've got a song. So uh, it felt very easy with Ashton uh, in the sense that he just would immediately come back with a vocal and a lyric and a melody that just was like, yep, yeah, that's it, you've nailed it, you know, straight away. And so we found that we'd demoed half a dozen songs within a space of just a a couple, uh, two or three months, really. It was very, very uh, productive. And with the long distance recording process, do you think that kind of gives you a little bit more of a headache at some times instead of being in the studio with the person that you're recording with? It's actually something I'm quite used to. If I go back again to the mission where I was recording albums with those guys back in the 90s, uh, a lot of the time, uh, we would just be encouraged by Wayne, the singer. Oh, you got any ideas, guys? You know, send it to me on a cassette or a CD. Uh, it's that long ago that yeah, cassettes were still around. <laughs> and uh, 
and you know, we, I'd send stuff to Wayne, and he'd be, and he'd, he'd be like, "Yeah, I like that one. I don't like that one so much." And then he would get some vocal ideas together. And then what would happen with the mission was that we would then be, uh, we'd all convene in some recording studio somewhere. This is all before everybody was running like Pro Tools and and Logic Studio and and Garage. Garage band and all that on their computers, you know, back in the nineties. Yeah, you, know, you, you still have to pretty much go into somebody's studio and do it properly. And yeah, you know, we'd like knock the songs into shape based on, say, one of my demos or one of Wayne's demos or the bass player's demo, and then they'd get released. So the only difference, so I'm quite used to working this way because I kind of always have since the nineties. And the only difference is that um, now that I've got a fairly sophisticated home studio setup. Um, and and so and so does Ashton. We can do an awful lot of it. You know, I don't need to like bring a drummer in. I was able to just do, sort of do drum programming and get the grooves together myself and record the bass lines myself and obviously the guitars and get it all together. Uh, with this actual album, I ended up uh, re- retrospectively getting the drummer from Killing Joke, uh, Paul Ferguson, and he actually retracts the drums at his end he lives out in new york in, in the new york area and then he would send me those files and i would import them into my studio so it was all still done like long distance but uh still felt fairly simple the, the only thing that you miss sometimes is that spark you get when you're all in the room together and you're jamming it out and there'll be a moment of creativity and spontaneity but in my experience with the bands i've been in they usually like to demo stuff out first and then just go in the studio and record it. So it's already kind of been orchestrated and hashed out already. So there's not that much room for experimentation and creativity like you would get with a band like Led Zeppelin who would probably record the same jam like 50 times and then pick the best one. Yeah. It's like a different approach. So you're kind of getting the spark and getting the creativity out as you're recording the guitar tracks before you even send it to anybody. Yeah, and and then uh, yeah, Ashton will come back with a sketch vocal, and then immediately it'll be then I'll then hear it and go, oh okay, so I need to like create a bit of space there for his vocal, and oh I need to beef that bit up a bit on the chorus, and oh the drums should do this, and so then it starts to evolve. So it's a similar process that to if we were in the same room and I stood there and there's a drummer there and there's a bass player there and I'd be like, okay guys, I want you to play it a bit more like this and and I'm going to play a bit more like this in this section. It's like a similar thing, but I'm just kind of making a lot of those decisions in my home studio. Uh, The the other advantage of it was that I was able to, I I mixed most of the album and I'm able to really, you know, I'll have an idea in my head of what I think it's going to sound like as a record and and hopefully I've achieved that. You know, I'm very happy with the sound of the Gemini Night album, and I think it pretty much is close to how I heard it in my head. And I always had that objective that I was aiming for, much like I'm sure Jimmy Page would would have... I like comparing myself to Jimmy Page. It's a good (laughs) analogy. Uh, Much like he probably had a vision for how the Zeppelin stuff was going to sound, and he would mix it. Yeah, he'd sit in the... Well, he was like executive producer, but he would sit in with the engineers and basically tell them what to do. And so I understand that. It's like he had this ultimate vision of where it was going. And I, I, I like to think I've got like the same thing going on. Uh, I just don't have as much money as Jimmy Page. <laughs> That's the only difference. <laughs> I think a lot I of us... As, I probably have as many guitars. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of us wish we had the money that Jimmy Page has. That's right, you know. But uh, yeah, he's just one of the few guys where I think, okay, yeah, he was just—he never wrote lyrics, and he never, you know, he never cared or took an interest in in doing, you know, getting involved in in the vocals. He, he just he just kind of oversaw, you know, the riff writing and the and a lot of the orchestration. And uh, but then you know, it's it, it, it then it was all obviously the band members bringing their own flavour into it. And on this album, I've got Paul Paul Ferguson from Killing Joke injecting his his drum flavour, like his. On every single track that he added his drums to, it just sounded way better. It sounded way more organic. Uh, so you just can't be working with actual real people and allowing their influences to come in onto the track. And Ashton's influences obviously came in. Uh, at the minute he sang on anything, it suddenly becomes, you know, an Ashton Knight production. The way the way he sings is very distinctive, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. What was your overall vision and mentality for this record that you wanted to put together like what did you kind of see in your head and hear in your head as you were going through the process and writing the rest for this uh well with with the 
previous record volumes I had absolutely no agenda at all it was just like a bunch of recordings that I had uh, demos that I had that hadn't been used by the various bands I was in and and some ideas for cover songs such as covering the ABBA song that we did Knowing Me Knowing You and uh, we did like a Human League cover and um, but there was no like musical agenda I mean I guess it's all in the rock and roll arena but like some of it was like gothy and some of it was like indie rock and some of it is almost verging on country rock and some of it is a bit folky some of it's a bit industrial and electronic I had like no agenda and I wanted it to be as varied as possible because I had different singers on the album about eight different singers and so it didn't I mean, I, my main fear with volumes was it weren't hanged together as a whole because mm-hmm. it's, it's like a compilation album with a bunch of different singers. And I didn't even worry about keeping the music in the same vibe. I just kind of did what I did. For some amazing reason, it does hang together. Maybe because I did it all in my studio and then the only thing that really changed was the singers were different. But the music was the same and it was all coming from me. So maybe that helped glue it together. But one thing I decided once Ashton and I started writing more and we kind of felt like the the two songs that we did on volumes one was called the reaping which actually is reprised on this new album and then another song was called jessamine they both are very much in the sort of hard gothic rock area kind of like a gothy billy idol vibe bit of marilyn manson in it it had that bit of sisters of mercy and we basically made the decision we're going to do a whole album in that vein. So there was like a definite template and agenda, and that was to write a whole album's worth of stuff using the Reaping and Jessamine as like the template sound, and I'm pretty pretty confident that we've achieved that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the album definitely screams that gothic, kind of industrial, little alternative style to the music. And I think that's one of one of the things that music is really kind of missing right now is uh, the originality to the sound and, you know, the blending of those genres that are kind of disappearing. Was that something that you kind of subconsciously thought when you were composing this record? Yeah, I mean, it's the record is like a reflection of, like when I hear Ashton singing, and, it, and it, to me it's evocative of singers like, you know, Andrew Eldritch, and Peter Murphy and Nick Cave and echoes of those kinds of singers, I I immediately, I started writing stuff with his voice in mind. Whereas with volumes, I had a bunch of demos and I would send various different demos to different singers and go, hey, which one tickles your fancy the most? <laughs> and it'd be quite varied in music in musical style. On, on the, the Gemini and I stuff, I, I was saying to Ashton, yeah, I'm writing more stuff in this vein. It's going to be more like The Reaping, more like Jessamine. And uh, and I was actually writing with his voice in mind. So, yeah, there was a definite agenda to recapture. I mean, some of the, the stuff that we liked uh, from our youth, such as, you know, Billy Idol and Generation X and Sisters of Mercy and The Cure and stuff like that, we're kind of capturing echoes of that in our music it's fairly yeah, we're wearing our influences on our sleeves there's a bit of Marilyn Manson in there a bit of Rob Zombie and just the stuff that I like I just wanted to make a hard rock but gothic tinged album there's still some variety on there uh, we, uh, we even do a Stone Temple Pilots cover uh, and uh, of course they're not considered to be goth at all um, and we didn't even pick one of their noisy ones you know Ashton wanted to cover Atlanta which is a very melancholy introspective, almost Doors, Doors-esque type song that Stan Temple Pilots did on their number five album. And when Scott Weiland died, Ashton wanted to do a cover of it and, and we included it on the album. I and mean, it actually is the album closer. But it, even on that one, yeah, I guess we kind of infused it with a little bit of a gothic melancholia to it. But uh, I like to think that we're working within the gothic rock environment, just much like the the Cure would, but you'd, yeah, you'd hear The Cure stretching the envelope of their sound, and I think we're trying to do the same. Oh yeah, totally, totally. And kind of stepping away from the record, let's talk a little bit about your career. And you've been in the industry for a very long time. What a very, com- very, very long time. <laughs> <I'm> old fart. <far>, yeah. <laughs> what is, what um what is the highlight like? What is your highlight reel when it comes to the, some of the biggest moments of your career? Um, mm. well, stuff that stuff that means a lot to me won't necessarily be you know the most impressive thing. You know, one of the first 
big shows that I did was when I joined the mission back in I joined the mission back in 1992, and then the following year we played at some benefit show uh, in the UK at the Leeds Town and Country Club, and uh, and it was a big show, and it was kind of seen as the mission's big comeback show. So I I, know, I always yeah I always, I, I'll always remember that as a very strong memory of playing to that crowd going berserk and uh, you know the real feeling of euphoria with the audience singing all the words and it was something I hadn't experienced before. Some of the other more things that may you know, maybe more like critically impressive is uh, I did some recording uh, for the BBC back in the early 90s um, where I recorded lead guitar and some tracks with Roger Daltrey who was singing and obviously uh, Roger Dolce being the front man of the Who, you can't get a much bigger band than the Who. So from oh, yeah. a kind of a, yeah, so from a kind of, you know, in, like the, the, one of the things that most impresses my father is that I've recorded some guitars with the <laughs> singer of the Who, you know, whereas, you know, he, he probably wouldn't be so bothered about some show with the mission, you know. Uh, the other, other highlights, probably with Tricky, who's a British hip-hop artist. He, he was from Massive Attack originally. I did some touring and albums with him in the late 90s into the 2000s, and we played the Glastonbury Festival oh, wow. um, in 1998. And we went on after a guy called Robbie Williams, who who was just releasing a solo album and became absolutely massive, like immediately afterwards. And then we were on before Blur, who were already a huge British indie band. Mm -hmm. And that was very strange to play main stage Glastonbury, over 60,000 people, just as the sun was setting, you know, over the field. <laughs> that was that was quite, a, quite a, an inspiring and a memorable moment that I'll never forget. That's amazing. There, there, there's a lot of great memories right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the list the list goes on, really. You know, I could sit here all day, probably remembering all sorts of things. <laughs> you know, and ho hopefully those uh, memories will you'll continue to add to those memories as uh, you know as the career keeps going, as the uh, time keeps passing on, too. Totally. Yeah, you, you've always got to be. Um, it always helps, I think, to be whether you're a musician or an artist or, or anything. You've always got to be you know, setting a new goal for yourself and a new aiming for something you know so yeah there's always going to be something that i'm going to be aiming for and uh, and i think that's healthy you know something that i aspire to do people that i aspire to play with or places that i aspire to go to you know that kind of thing or guitars that i aspire to own that's always <laughs> the top one for me <laughs> you have to buy a whole new house just for the guitars right yeah yeah it's getting that way totally yeah um, you, you're talking, you were talking about goals. What is the goal now? Now that you got this record completed and it's going to be dropping soon, what's your next goal? Uh, most next on the agenda is, uh, promote the album. So we have a tour coming up next month, uh, in March, uh, US tour. We're going on, on the road with our label mates from Cleopatra and that's Yerky, Yerky 69, who is, uh, best known as the front man for the Finnish band, the 69 Eyes who are a pretty, pretty big band over in Europe. And uh, this is going to be his first uh, solo outing to promote his solo record that also came out on Cleopatra last year. And we're going to be co-headlining along with them. And so, yeah, that's our big thing next month is to, you know, get on the road, see how, see how these songs sound live, you know, see how they go down. And, uh, you know, we'll be selling our album at the shows. Obviously, you can get it online at Amazon and iTunes and... We have a band camp page, but uh, yeah, you can't be actually playing some shows and people actually buying the album. And uh, yeah, so we're just going to get out there and play some shows and really see, uh, get a feel for MG. We did some shows last summer. We did a festival in Germany and uh, a festival in, in the UK, but it, this would be nice. It's a full tour and we'll get a real feel for how the song, songs in the album and the band perform as a live unit. You brought up festival season. Festival season in the U.S. is about to kick off in yeah. probably about a week or two. Are there any festivals that you're looking forward to maybe attending? Um, you know, not a big one for going to festivals. I think part of the problem is, you know, when you play these festivals as a musician, you get spoiled, right? You get the backstage <laughs> pass and you, you get, get access fed. to those places. 
those private toilets that you know they're like you don't have to line up for and all that sort of thing. So I, I always find that I'm not as enthusiastic about going to festivals when I'm not playing. So yeah, I don't really. I mean, I might pop to Coachella. Maybe I played that one year with Tricky, and that was another memorable occasion. Um, I remember watching Jane's Addiction, who were headlining the main stage. Uh, the band, the headliner would get towards, to, to soundcheck the day before the festival opened. So I wandered over, I could hear some guitar coming from the main stage. And I wandered over and it was Jane's Addiction soundchecking. And it was just basically Jane's Addiction, their crew, and a smattering of crew in the field and watching them like jam some Led Zeppelin song. And I'm like, <laughs> how cool is this? You know? Yeah, that's You've awesome. got to really be on the inside to really appreciate something like this. So, uh, yeah, I've been spoiled with stuff like that. So going to Coachella or some of the other festivals just as a regular punter is a little bit depressing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one last question before I let you go. Um, comparing the music sing scene in England to the music scene in the US. How does our music and our entire scene overall kind of compare to the one across the pond? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, the most notable thing that I would always notice when I would come over to the US, because my, my father lived in Buffalo when I was a teenager, and so I'd come over and visit him. Uh, my folks had divorced, and I, the thing that would strike me immediately was the amount of rock and roll and, and hard rock you would hear on mainstream radio over here. Um, you know, you stick on the radio and you'd be hearing all, sort, all manner of hard rock bands blasting it out. And um, that was something you didn't really get in the UK. But then again, I got exposed to a lot of punk rock and new wave on the radio in the UK that apparently wasn't on the radio over here. So I guess it sort of swings and roundabouts in a way. But uh, yeah, I guess just more the prevalence of like rock and roll music on the radio over here. And I think American audiences generally are more open to uh, artists experimenting with their sounds and just more open in general. I think British audiences, the minute you get successful, they tend to get a bit cynical and they don't want you to change. And they'll come down and you know, the British press would come down on British artists quite heavily. Whereas over in America, I think you've always got a chance at a second a second go around, you know, you can release a bad album and then, you know, if you follow that up with a great album, you know, all is forgotten yeah. and uh, you can be back on top. So I find the American music seems to be good and it, it's quite healthy in that sense. It definitely, you know, it supports its artists, definitely. And you, you got the best of the both worlds on that one. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I, I enjoy being over here. I still enjoy getting into my car and uh, and I'll probably have it on some classic rock station and there'll be uh, any hour of the day they'll be playing a Led Zeppelin song and I just <laughs> think that's fantastic there's something reassuring about that you know to be in California turn on your, your ignition and uh, when the levee breaks is playing or something like that it <laughs> just puts a smile on my face because that would never happen in the UK you know oh yeah that's pretty much everything that I got for you man is there anything that I didn't touch on that you would like to add uh, no I think we uh, I think we covered all the bases um, if anybody wants to find out anything more about myself or MGT the band they can go to uh, mgtofficial.com and you'll find all the tour dates on there links to our our new album pre-orders uh, the existing singles and and uh, discography that uh, we already have out and uh, yeah yeah just looking forward to catching people on the road next month 